I am very excited about this message. A couple of reasons. One, I love the text that I'm going to be preaching out of. It's found in the book of Joshua chapter 14. And secondly, this message is being received at five locations. So Wexford, our broadcast location. Yeah, Oakland, Sewickley Valley, East End, and joining us today for the first time, our new Dormont campus. So, so excited that, North, that Northway is now in the South Hills, right? Beyond the rivers and the tunnels where the Stevens clan has roamed the, the land for many years. So, so excited about this. You know, each year at Northway, we choose a book of the Bible to focus on for that particular year. Typically what we do is we break that up into four or five series and come in and out of it throughout the year. And this year, if you were with us, back in January, we announced that we were going to go through the book of Judges. And so far up to date, we've worked through the first 12 chapters of Judges. We're going to come back to Judges right around Father's Day for a two-week study on the Judge Samson. The series is going to be titled Stories from the Man Cave. And I can't wait. There'll be more information about that coming. Today I want to look at a story that I said is found in Joshua, which is the book right before the book of Judges. And then next week on Mother's Day, I want to look at the book of Ruth, which is found right after the, the book of of Judges. This, the message next week is going to focus on Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, and we will focus particularly on this concept of the providence of God. And in that message, there's going to be a moment, and, and really throughout the whole service, where we're going to speak specifically to single moms. So I would really encourage you that if you know a single mom, invite her out with you next week. Um, and then I want to say this about Mother's Day. I want to acknowledge that Mother's Day can be a difficult weekend for women to do church sometimes. You know, some actually prefer just to stay home. Maybe they've had a difficult relationship with their mother. Maybe they've been unable to have children. Or maybe they've even recently lost mom. H hear me, I promise to be sensitive and I am confident that this topic, the providence of God, the hand of God, this God that guides us in the unseen as well as the seen, will speak practically to all of us. So please join us next week. So let me set up today's scripture. Stay with me here. I'm going to sort of backtrack so you know where this particular conversation or this chapter 14 of Joshua takes place. Moses, he's led the nation of Israel out of Egypt, 400 years of slavery. You know the stories, right? Plagues, locusts, frogs, seas being parted, and now they're headed to the promised land, the land that God promised them all the way back to the time of Abraham. And as a prelude to them possessing the land, Moses, if you're familiar with this story, he sends out 12 spies to scout out the promised land, Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they come back with this great, upbeat report. They say this, you know, the land there, it's amazing. It indeed does flow of milk and honey. And oh yeah, there's some big cities over there, well fortified. And we also, while we were spying this out, we saw that there were some giants living over there. But God said it was ours. So let's take him at his word and let's go get it. And then if you know the other part of this story, the other ten spies who saw the same exact thing. They come back and they say the cities are strong and they are wall walled and there are giants over there that make us look like grasshoppers. And I don't care what God said. If we go over there, we're going to get our rear ends handed to us. So this causes them and to, to cause the nation of Israel to tremble in fear. And instead of obeying God and seizing the land that he promised, they disobey and they shrink back in fear. And you know the story. They wander in the desert now for 40 years. And that allows the sort of disobedient and fearful folks to pass on, leaving this new generation ready to obey God and take the land. After the death of Moses, it's left to Joshua, one of the two original spies that came back with a good report to lead them into the promised land. And for the next several years, the book of Joshua, it records these epic, these epic stories of God winning victory after victory of his nation settles into the promised land. So this is before the book of Judges that we've been studying. And you know in the book of Judges it concentrates on this cycle of how the people continually turn away from God once they're in the land. But in Joshua 14, there's this amazing conversation 
that's recorded between Joshua, the leader of the nation, the one that took him into the promised land, and Caleb, the other spy that came back with a good report. These men are now 80 plus years old when they have this conversation right here. I mean, they are God followers to the core, and they are battle-worn and tested warriors. And in Joshua 14, verse 6, it says this. These are in your notes. They'll also be up on the screen for you to read along. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, the, the, and Caleb, the son of Jephuna, and I worked really hard on that, and that's how it's pronounced, Jephuna, the, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord, now this is Caleb talking, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me, Caleb here says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers, he's talking about the other 12 spies, went up with me and made the heart of the people melt. So I wholly followed the Lord my God, and Moses swore on that day, said, say, surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. So recap what's going on here. Stay with me. Caleb, he approaches Joshua, and he begins with this sort of quick history lesson. It's like he's sort of saying to Joshua, I know we're a couple of old soldiers here, and maybe you've gotten hit in the head with too many rocks, but I want to remind you of a few things. I want to take you back. 45 years or so, and remind you, Joshua, what I said that day when we came back from that spy adventure. So Caleb, what he said is recorded over in the book of Numbers, probably not a book many of you have camped out in, but in Numbers chapter 13, verse 30, Caleb says this to all the people. They've come back from their spy adventure. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then this is where the other ten spies turned the nation of Israel. In the very next verse, then the men who had gone up with him, the other ten, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel bad reports in the land that they had spied out, saying, the land which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And the people that we saw in it are of great height. So why is Caleb so confident that we can take it? Because Caleb was present when Moses spoke, when he said what God had promised them, Caleb was there. And that conversation is re recorded in Deuteronomy 9, verse 1. Look real closely. This is Moses speaking. But we look real closely at what Moses says and who he says is going to win the battle. Moses says this, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over to Jordan today, to go in to depossess the nations greater and mightier than the cities great fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of Anakim, whom you know... And of whom you have heard, it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? I'll come back and explain that. No, therefore, today, that he goes over before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. Caleb was there. When God spoke through Moses and said, I know there are giants over there. That doesn't surprise me, but I am going to go ahead of you and give you victory. God promised to proceed them as a divine warrior to secure victory for their cause. So now let's go back to Caleb's conversation with Joshua, back to, to Joshua 14, this conversation that they were having, and it says this, Caleb speaking again, verse 10, and now behold, the Lord has kept me alive just as he said these 45 years since the time the Lord spoke his word to Moses, that's what I just read, while Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I am this day 85 years old. 
I am still as strong today as I was in the day of Moses sent me. My strength now is my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now here's his request. This is the, 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 this is the big point of the conversation that they're having. Caleb's request to Joshua. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard that on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Lots there. Let, let's unpack a couple things, okay? Three things that Caleb is saying in this, in this conversation with Joshua that I think we can learn from as God's followers today. And the first one is this. Whether you're young and battle ready or whether you're old and battle worn, Caleb is saying, I'm not done. He's saying, I'm still strong, man. I, I still have a kingdom fight left in me. You know, in this, in this conversation, he could have reminded Joshua of his great past epic battles and accomplishments, but he resists the temptation to live in the past. Folks, we are to build on the past, but live in the future. We, we, are, to, we are called. You know, let me just ask you a question when it comes to this topic. When was your last epic mountaintop moment with God? Do you have to go all the way back to junior high on some retreat? Do you have to go back to, you know, a high school mission trip? When is the last time you had any influence on the kingdom of God? You're not dead yet. Get involved. Some of you, maybe that means taking the step of baptism, taking a risk for God. Let God know that you're like Caleb and you are not done. The second thing that Caleb teaches is that, you know, in this moment, Caleb, if you think about it, he had every right to ask for his inheritance, his land, to be like some sweet little plot by a lake. He, he had every right just to ask for that waterfront condo where he could sit back and chill. He could have asked Joshua for a peaceful valley with a stream or maybe something with a beach where I can watch the sunset. But instead, Caleb, he's making it clear he's not ready for predictable comfort. Let me explain this, this Anakim and this descendants of Anak. The Bible refers to them several times. The Anakim were perceived to be gigantic people. You know, brutal, fierce warriors. The ten spies with the bad report told of them. And through Moses, God acknowledges that they were present in the land. Now, this is really important. Track with me here. When the nation of Israel came into the promised land, they defeated the inhabitants. But it says that the remnants of the defeated peoples fled to the hill country. So please... Make sure that you fully understand what Caleb is asking for here. He's asking for an inheritance that he feels is his due. Give me the hill country. Because I heard that the Anakim still roam there. I'm not dead. I'm not ready for predictable comfort. I'm not done. I want the hills. Or I can wage war on the giants. See, I, I, believe Caleb, I believe that God is still looking for Caleb's. Individuals that look beyond the majority report of the ten spies and instead take God at his word. Do you know that three times in what I read in that passage in the book of Joshua, Caleb says that he followed God wholeheartedly. If you, if you take the original Hebrew of this word wholeheartedly, right? And you break it out, do you know what it means? Wholeheartedly, that, that's it. Following God with your whole heart. It, it is just what it is. It, it means giving it all you got. How many of us are pursuing God wholeheartedly? See, I believe there are a lot of people here today that believe in Jesus and that have made a decision to trust him but see, hear me, if that's you. You are loved, man, and you are forgiven. But don't stop there. 
God has a journey and an adventure and a plan for you. Don't stop just inside the entrance to the kingdom and forgiven and loved. You know what that would be like? That would be like going to Disney's Magic Ken Kingdom. Passing through the entrance gates and stopping. And sitting on a bench. And saying, oh, there's some beautiful landscaping over there. Look at that. And oh, look, we could maybe hit this concession stand. If we get up on our tippy toes, we can even see the, the top of, of Cinderella's castle over there, right? Don't stop at the entrance to the kingdom. Get into that kingdom. Put those Mickey Mouse ears on. Ride some rides. Exhaust yourself. It's the happiest place on earth, for goodness sakes, right? Don't stop at the entrance to the kingdom. Get moving inside there. Northway. What, what if we as a church decide to build on the past but live for the future? What if we were to say to God, you know, we're not, we're not done yet. What if we ask God for the hills where the giants still roam? I want to spend just a couple minutes in this sermon talking about the vision of Northway in this next season. A vision that I want to invite you to be part of. Do you know, seven years ago, we made a decision to leverage the blessing that God had heaped on Northway Wexford to launch Northway Oakland. And at that point, we became what is known as a multi-site church. We had people that were living in that area and driving sometimes more than 30 minutes to come to Wexford, and we decided to be generous and then to send resource and our best and brightest to start a church there. Because, see, I believe the gospel works best when you worship where you live and where you go to church. I believe in distinct churches in distinct areas that are about the context of the community that they're in, where mem members engage with local businesses and serve the needs of those areas. After Oakland came Sewickley Valley, then the East End, and today we worship in Dormont. You know, folks, we sent our best and our brightest to Dormont. The, the, the four current campuses invested nearly a million dollars to launch Northway, Dormont. If you have been around Northway for the last several years, you've probably heard me say this. Our dream is to reach 1% of the greater Pittsburgh population. Do you know that the latest sentence, cens the latest census says that Pittsburgh's five county region represents about 2.3 million people and our hope is to reach about 23,000 by launching distinct churches in distinct communities around Pittsburgh. You know, Caleb, he, he asked for the hill country. And I believe this is the hill country that we've asked God for. Pittsburgh, it's a region that's separated by tunnels and rivers and hills, and we can no longer remain in Wexford and ask people to travel to us. Instead, we made them a commitment to go to the hills and through the tunnels and across the rivers, right? And I want to take a few minutes and address our teaching team and why we use technology to bring the sermon to each location. Is it because we like being all slick with our video screens and high-tech HD equipment? No. So, so, so a couple thoughts on this. One, it's a stewardship issue for me and not a technology issue. We do not want five different people spending 25 hours of their work week preparing a solid biblical sermon when they could be serving you and their unique community. Folks, I, I want them praying for you. I want them visiting you when you're not well. I want them by your side during the difficult times and celebrating with you through the tremendous times like weddings and graduations and births of children. I want them building great teams and, and creating powerful ministries. I want them being active, meeting the needs of the community that they're in. I want them to have a balanced schedule that they can still manage and care for their families' wells, and that's very difficult to do when all of them would have been spending 20-plus hours a week investing in sermon prep. Do you know that our series, that, that, that they're based on, on what we hear from you? You might wonder, well, how, do we, how do we figure out what we're going to preach on? And clearly God, and I'm going to get to that in a second, but, but first of all, one of the first things, we, 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 we sit and have coffee with you. 
We, we talk about what you're challenged with, what's going on in your life, what are you facing, and then we gather up and pray to God for, for direction on what he wants to say to you through us. And then we spend months preparing these teaching series. Do you know that there's a group called the teaching team that locks themselves in a room twice a month for three to five hours? In that room, we have a lot of creative people. Amy Smith, this amazing worship artist, an extremely creative person is, is in that room. Rob Berkey, who oversees our worship at all of our campus, is part of that team. Chris, Chris Prexta. You know, he's the co-creator of Pittsburgh Dad. He's a filmmaker. He's an incredible believer. He's an incredible creative person. He gives a cultural lens, and he's in that room. The good doctor, Jim Platt, a professor at Duquesne University and at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. This guy is fluent in Greek and Hebrew. He has multiple masters and multiple doctorates. He's one of this city's preeminent authorities on the Bible, and he's in that room when we birth these series and and, you know then we divide up the the sermons uh, amongst the teachers myself being one of them Ken Chevalier is on that teaching team and one of your teachers 10 plus years in student ministry background Uh, I would call him our sort of compassionate passionate preacher on this team he will make you laugh and cry sometimes make himself cry all in the same sermon his teaching is very real it's authentic it's transparent and it always has what I call handles on it these applications that you can take home and use. Eugene Freedom Blackwell, pit athlete turned Homewood Street evangelist, Presbyterian seminary trained, brilliant, very gritty and honest, challenging and profound preaching. He brings a diverse and often unique perspective to our team. Doug Melder, probably the most well-read person that, that I know He's one of the most insightful thinkers that that I've ever met. When Doug preaches, I learn something new and amazing every single time. He can take a scripture that you may have heard or or, or known for for over seen a hundred times, and he can bring something new out of it every single time. And then you will see others from time to time, including our founding pastor, Jay Passavent, as well as occasional other guests. You know, in August, we're bringing in Pastor Heather Zempel. Uh, as a guest preacher. She is an incredible teacher. She preaches at an amazing church down in Washington called National Community Church. We are fans and friends of that church. And then about 20% of the time, we we, we do what we we call go live. And that's where a member of the teaching team or your campus pastor preaches live to you and contextualizes it right to your community. Just a heads up, the next time we do that, will be on May 18th when we launch a series called The Church. So our hill country is the Pittsburgh region. We want to build on the past, not live there, and we want to live for the future. So what are our giants? You know, Jesus, he warned his disciples that that the world would be against them. So, So we know, right? that sin and brokenness and that we have an enemy in in this world that will always be among our giants. But I believe there's a specific giant that has roamed the rivers and hills of our region for many years, and it's called religion. See, see religion tells people it's all about the rules, and, and it's all about guilt and shame. And this giant, at times, become so concerned about preserving traditions and customs of the past that sadly in this region, many of our younger generation have been lost. You know, Jesus started a movement led by dreamers and visionaries 2,000 years ago, and sadly at times it's become an institution led by historians and managers. You know, a God that represented the future became a church that that is so often first and foremost committed to protecting the past. One of my favorite pastors, Eugene, I mean, sorry, Pastor Erwin McManus at Mosaic Church in Los Angeles, he said this recently, how did we become the last bastion of the protection of yesterday instead of the epicenter, the creation of tomorrow? 
The church was never supposed to be known for its grip on tradition. Rather, it was supposed to be known for its love of humanity. The church is not here for us. We are the church, and we are here for the world. In Matthew 9, verse 12, Jesus is addressing the religious authority of his day when he says this. This is a scripture that many of you might be familiar with. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. And he's talking to the religious authority. He's saying this, I desire mercy and not sacrifice or religion. For I came not to call the righteous but sinners. Folks, religion, now hear me on this, it has its place. It provides answers to questions that we readily don't have answers for. It gives us context for like, what happens when, when we die? How, how am I supposed to treat people? You know, how am I supposed to conduct my marriage or raise my kids? Religion, it gives us principles to live by. It provides us with ethical and, and moral boundaries. It provides some certainty in uncertain times. Religion has its place. But Jesus warned us about religion. Jesus came to make it clear that religion has its place, but it's not first place. Relationship with God and with each other, grace and mercy need to always be in first place. I firmly believe, folks, there are so many people out there that they want to know how to live, not how to die. And at times we need to stop talking about following God as some re reward for when we die or some list of obligations and duties while we're alive. You know, I am concerned, as your pastor, that there are a lot of people that think they are following Jesus, but have only invited Jesus to follow them. A lot of people trying to follow the rules to get to heaven, but not really following Jesus. Pa pastor Kent said, this right before Easter in a sermon. He said, Jesus is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. It's this middle ground of being religious that's cheating folks out of knowing God and knowing who God wants them to become. Giants can't be defeated if we're consent sitting on a bench at the entrance of the kingdom. We gotta get in and fight for the kingdom. You have to make up your own mind exactly what this looks like for you. And in a moment, I'm gonna give you three things that I really think in this next season at Northway that we need to be about. But first, I absolutely have to say this. Some of you have no margin to take part in any meaningful kingdom work. You have created a life and a schedule that's pushed God's kingdom to the leftover, guilt-ridden, dutiful expressions of religious obedience. So therefore, may I would suggest to you that before you can pursue the hill country where the giants roam, I wanna first challenge you to determine what are you going to stop doing? Do you want to pass on basketball and hockey to your kids? Or do you want to pass on your faith? Do you want to store up more stuff on earth or treasures that you can use in heaven for eternity? Are you going to pursue the American dream or kingdom impact? You have to decide and then you have to decide what you're gonna stop doing. And then here's a couple things I would encourage you to consider in this next season if Northway is your home. One, invite people to come to church with you. We have empty seats at all of our locations that are waiting for your friends to be sitting in. Take the time to invest in people that are far from God and then invite them to church. Secondly, each of our campuses, you might not be aware of this, are involved in local mission efforts right where their campus is in their particular community. And do you know that each of our campuses has local mission council volunteer representatives? 
that can get you plugged in to serving right in your local community. Maybe today just indicate on that communicator card, I, I, wanna, I wanna get involved locally in, in some mission efforts and projects. Can somebody get me some information and we will get back to you. And then lastly is this, we, we introduced a four part online discipleship foundational tool that we called Prepare the two weeks before Easter. I would really encourage you to, to go online and walk through this with a friend or at least get comfortable with it on your own. And then this challenge is for those of you that have been walking with the Lord for a while. You need to be discipling someone and we will help you. We have tools to get to you. We have people that want someone to disciple them that we don't have enough people raising their hands to be disciplers. Disciple someone. If you are ready to do that, want to do that, want more information, just check that off on your communicator card, right? You know, I, I want more information about possibly discipling someone. So, so let me quick review and then, and then I'll wrap up. Decide what you're going to stop doing and then decide what you're going to do. Folks, move out of the entrance and go into the kingdom. Don't live in the past. Build on the past and live in the future. And there are hills where giants still roam. And you're not done. And let me tell you, predictability and comfort are way overrated. And, and the last thought, and I really beg you to hear me on this. I do not want anybody that ever calls Northway home to someday stand before the judgment seat of God and regret that they didn't pursue the hill country where the giants roam. So you are officially invited into this journey of faith. I'm gonna let each campus leader sort of come up and, and close out their campus now.